thank you so much for having us. It's a, it's a great honor to to join this conversation. It, thank you so much. I'm so excited, you know, to like share about Golconda Diamonds. Mm -hmm. So, guys, um, welcome to all of you all. And today we are in for spectacular diamond talk. With us uh, is uh, Ito Ulrika, who is a GIA Diamond Research Senior Manager, and she is going to be talking to us all about Golconda Diamonds. Let's begin by knowing about the history of uh, diamond mining in India. Okay, so something that a lot of people don't realize is that the first diamonds ever found actually mm -hmm. came from India. So they were discovered around the uh, fourth century before Christ. Mm -hmm. So about uh, 300 years uh, before Christ was born. And the first references of them can be found in Sanskrit texts where they were already valued as these beautiful, uh, powerful uh, talismans at mm -hmm. the time. Uh, originally, they were traded within the Indian world, the Persian world, the Islamic world. And mm -hmm. then eventually, in about the 13th century, famous travelers from Europe started arriving as well, such as right. Marco Polo, we had Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, and Jacques de Court in the 17th century. And they started bringing these Indian diamonds to, to the European courts as well. Mm -hmm. And that's really how they started becoming extremely famous worldwide at the time. And one of the interesting things about these diamonds is that they're alluvial diamonds meaning okay. that they are found in sort of river basins, ancient river basins, rather than at the original source where they came up from the deep earth. So they're much more difficult to find. Right. Um, and they, they were able to find them in riverbeds, and this uh, led to a lot of sort of ancient myths about where they came from. Mm -hmm. All right. That's very interesting to know. So tell us what are Golconda diamonds, since we're talking about Golconda diamonds. So let's see, what are these diamonds? So Golconda diamonds are uh, diamonds that are thought to come from the Golconda region in, mm -hmm. uh, in India. So this is sort of in the southern part of India, uh, very close to Hyderabad. So here we have a little yes. image where you yes. can see Hyderabad. So it would be this, this region there. Mm -hmm. right. And you can see a uh, famous mines at the time was the Kolur mine. So that's sort of the source of a lot of the very, very famous stones that are seen and sort of associated with Golconda. Mm -hmm. So around Hyderabad at the time, it, it was the part of the Golconda Sultanate. And around mm -hmm. the 16th, uh, 16th, 17th century, the Mughal Empire took over in that region. Massive, massive uh, trading center at the Golconda Fort. So what makes these Golconda diamonds so unique and why are they so, so popular? So they're very popular because they're characterized generally by this, uh, they're very large. The historic mm -hmm. ones are very large. They have this limpid transparency to them. They're associated mm -hmm. with being very high purity. And okay. since with modern analysis techniques, we've actually found that they're associated with a very, very rare diamond type known as type two, which accounts mm -hmm. for less than 2% of uh, gem diamond production. So extremely high purity stones. Mm -hmm. And what is type 2? Because, you know, we've been hearing uh, in the books of history that Golconda diamonds are type 2. So please uh, talk to our audience. What does type 2 mean? So type 2 uh, has to do with effectively the presence or absence of nitrogen or boron related impurities. I mm -hmm. know that we like to think of diamonds as being perfect crystals, but they actually contain very, very minute atomic impurities in them. Mm -hmm. And that actually can give us some very interesting characteristics such as color. Mm -hmm. So these Golconda diamonds uh, contain very low concentrations of nitrogen and very low concentrations of potentially boron-related impurities. And this mm -hmm. can be analyzed using spectroscopic techniques by looking at the interaction of infrared light with the diamond. Okay, okay so you mean to say that one can actually figure out whether it's a type 2 diamond or not? Yes, yes. So the, wow. the type 2 diamond classification system is something that can be an, uh, analyzed using advanced spectroscopic techniques at a gem lab. So it's, for instance, one of the things that, that GIA does, we have this diamond typing letter system and it can help uh, improve the value of a stone because they are so extremely rare. Fantastic. And there was an interesting question asked in the audience, what does type 2B mean? So 2B means that there's no nitrogen as seen by okay. the IR, but it contains a little bit of boron. And this okay. is actually potentially a very exciting thing because if you have enough of that boron, you get blue color. So for instance, the Hope wow. Diamond, 
right. which is obviously extremely famous and very, very valuable, is blue because of the presence of this boron. So either which ways, whether you, whether it's a type 2A, which means no nitrogen, or mm -hmm. type 2B, which means a presence of boron, makes a diamond valuable. Exactly, exactly. Wow. Very, very rare. They, they account for, you know, less than 2% together. And the boron containing ones are even more rare. So they're, wow. they're, they're very uh, special. And then because a lot of these large historic diamonds from Golconda have been analyzed in modern times, we've been able to associate that a lot of these are actually type 2 diamonds. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it's important to note that if you have a type 2 diamond, it doesn't necessarily mean it comes from Golconda. So type okay. 2 diamonds, although rare, they can be found in other locations around the world as well. So in modern times, we have found them at the Litsang mine in Lesotho. We have found them at the Cullinan mine in South Africa and uh, some other mines in Botswana as well. So type 2 isn't necessarily synonymous with um, Golconda diamonds. But most Golconda diamonds that exist nowadays are going to be oh. type 2. So can one know whether their diamond is type 2, type 2A, or it's type 2B? So you could um, help at least improve the chances of having a type 2. So strictly speaking, it has to go into a gem lab and be analyzed by spectroscopic methods. But uh, a type 2 diamond would generally be, if it's type 2A, it's going to be very high color. So very right. little color to it. It's going to have very few inclusions, if any. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, they're larger stones as well. And mm -hmm. they don't show any fluorescence. So the defects that okay. cause fluorescence in diamonds aren't really present in these uh, type 2 diamonds. So if you have a diamond that just is very transparent, has no fluorescence, has no inclusions, mm -hmm. and no color, then mm -hmm. you've got a shot of having a type 2 diamond. So that would be a good good candidate for further analysis. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's a Golconda diamond, right? It's just no, a type not, 2 diamond. It, um, it, wow. that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a... So generally for the Golconda diamonds, these are going to be diamonds that have a very ancient history or very old cuts, for instance, something that links them towards the, the Indian, the Indian uh, region of ancient right. times. Mm -hmm. So now before we take more questions from the audience, let's have a look at some of the famous Golconda diamonds and maybe we can go through and understand the cut of these Golconda diamonds as you show so some examples to us. Of course. So one of the most famous um, Golconda diamonds is going to be the Koh i Noor. So here mm -hmm. we have an image of uh, Queen Victoria of right. England wearing the Koh i Noor as a brooch. Mm -hmm. So this diamond is thought to originate from the Kolor mine. And it's uh, approximately 105 carats now, but originally it was thought to be much larger. In fact, when she received it, it was 186 carats. And they recut it in the UK, unfortunately, in order to improve its sparkle a little bit. So they did modify it. And now it's part of the Royal Crown Jewels, and it can be found mounted on the uh, Queen yes. Mother's um, wow. crown. And the interesting thing with this uh, stone is if you happen to be in London, you can actually visit and see the real uh, Golconda diamond in the, temp in the uh, Tower of London. Wow, lovely. So that would be one of the most uh, famous colorless stones. Another example would be the Orloff diamond shown here. Oh, beautiful, yes. Which is uh, approximately 190 carats in size. Wow. It has this ancient mogul cut to it. So it looks a little bit like half an egg that has lots of little facets around it. And uh, this was uh, something that was uh, bought by uh, Count Orlov. And it was given as a gift to his lover, the Empress Catherine the Great from Russia. And now it's mounted in the Imperial Scepter in Russia. You mentioned yeah. that 190 carats. So I'm just thinking, how big must be the original rough, you know, which they must have discovered in the Golconda mine? It must be really, really, really huge. Exactly. Crazy. Crazy. Exactly. I mean, wow. oftentimes you, 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 get a, you get a huge loss because it is an ancient cut from mm -hmm. from a sort of a, a traditional Indian cut, usually they'd be trying to retain as much weight as right. possible, but mm -hmm. it could have been, you know, hundreds of carats larger. Now, would you like to talk to us about the cutting style of these Golconda diamonds? Since the modern round brilliant cut only came about in about 1920. So 19. these all these uh, Golconda diamonds, the most, fam the most famous ones and the most um, requested ones, shall we say, right. are going to be the ones that have these original ancient cuts. Originally, wow. in India, it was thought that cutting the diamond was actually a source of evil. So they wanted the, the diamond to be uncut, fully uncut. 
But eventually, uh, people started focusing on doing a little bit of cleaving and a little bit of cutting within India. The four most common cuts at the time would have been a portrait cut, which is effectively yeah. two tables with a few yeah. girdles going around it. You sometimes see those being used as uh, windows on top of portraits. And there was the table cut, where they literally just chop off right. the uh, point of uh, the octahedral crystal. There was a mogul cut, which has lots mm -hmm. of little brilliant facets, such as the Orlov uh, stone. Right. And then uh, eventually you also had a few irregular cuts. So that's sort of how they were being traded at the time. Mm -hmm. um, here we have an example of Jean-Baptiste uh, Tavernier, who just has a record of some of the diamonds that he bought in India in the 17th century. And one right. of the highlighted ones here is actually what eventually turned out to be the uh, Hope Diamond. So you can see that at the time, it, it had just been blocked to sort of maintain the weight. Mm -hmm. And then in about the 16th century, 16th, 17th century, uh, Mughal emperors became very attracted to the um, European cuts. So that's when start the stones started being exported to Europe, being recut, returning to India as well. Since you spoke about that the cut eventually evolved, right, from mm -hmm. the from the ancient diamond cut to the European cut. So do we have any notable examples of the recently auctioned Golconda diamonds? So in the past 20 years, we've had uh, quite a few uh, uh, famous Golconda diamonds being sold. So an example would be the Widelsbach Graf, or this beautiful wow. uh, blue diamond um, yes. that at the time when it was sold, it was about 35.56 carats, and then they cut it down to 31 carats. It was bought by uh, the Graf Group, mm -hmm. and that was in order to just improve its uh, color and appearance, give it a little bit more right. sparkle, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, another example would be the Princey Diamond. It's a beautiful pink diamond, a type 2A mm -hmm. diamond, mm -hmm. um, which is about, again, 34 uh, carats, 34.64 carats. And that one is, is actually currently part of a, a, a dispute about ownership. So it, it's got a very interesting uh, current history, shall we say. And then another example would be the uh, Archduke uh, Joseph beautiful. diamond. Yes. So these are all uh, beautiful diamonds that have been sold in the past 20 years uh, that are Golconda diamonds. So auction houses love Golconda diamonds uh, because right. it's considered to be effectively the origin of diamonds. And which is your favorite Golconda diamond? Ooh, I've got a soft spot for the Hope <laughs> diamond. <laughs> so the Hope diamond um, is an interesting diamond because it was originally uh, sold. It was found uh, and sold by Tavernier. Mm -hmm. And he sold it to uh, a king in a, in a, a, a a French king, King Louis XIV uh, in 1668, who then right. re renamed it the French Blue, as shown here. Originally, the stone was 115 carats, and he cut it down to a 69 carat stone and mounted it in this beautiful Order of the Fleece um, wow. setting here. So that was a sort of order that was very famous at the time. During the French Revolution, it was yes. stolen, it disappeared, and right. then eventually showed up in London in 1812 where it got sold between different uh, famous families and uh, famous uh, jewelry groups and eventually made its way to Harry Winston mm -hmm. in the U.S. And he actually donated it to the Smithsonian in 1958. Yes. So the Hope Diamond in its current setting looks like this. The, one of the very neat things is that when it was shipped from New York by Harry mm -hmm. Winston to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., it was yes. shipped using just regular mail. So you have here the wow. envelope that was originally sent in. It's got a Such very a, exciting, exciting history. Valuable diamond was just shipped using a regular mail, is it? Exactly, exactly. Wow. Wonderful. Guys, do you have any more questions for Golconda diamonds? And in the meanwhile, if, talk to us more about these diamonds and your experience since you are a senior diamond researcher at the GIA, something that, uh, that has always fascinated you about these Golconda diamonds. So in addition to, to the rarity of them, just because they are stones that have to have survived through the processes through all these uh, centuries and the rarity of the diamond type, um, they are usually very large, beautiful stones. And we're extremely blessed at GIA that they oftentimes come through us for either grading services or uh, monographs. So we actually write books about the history of the stones that are shared with the owners of stones and then sold off at auction. So we've been extremely lucky to see these uh, stones. 
these uh, type two diamonds in particular are oftentimes associated with extreme depths as well. So most diamonds are formed at about 150, 200 kilometers beneath the earth. But uh, a lot of type 2A diamonds have actually been associated with depths all the way down to about 800 kilometers. So super deep diamonds. Again, a very, very rare subset that makes them even more unique than most diamonds that yes. you can find in the trade. So Mukesh is asking that is Daria a Noor diamond also from Golconda? Yes, Mukesh, that diamond is the, also the, from... Yes, it is. Yes, the Daria mm -hmm. Noor. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are several uh, famous uh, Golconda diamonds. Another famous one that would match your outfit is the uh, Dresden Green. Oh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> so the Dresden Green is a, a is a beautiful stone that they have at the Dresden Castle, and it's the uh, most green diamond in the world. So you can see it here. So it's a 41 carat uh, diamond that, again, has gone through royalty in the Habsburg courts, yes. et cetera, in, in the... Mm -hmm. um, in the German and Bavarian courts and Habsburg courts. Mm -hmm. So does GI also issue a Golconda certificate? Uh, we do not. So we, we issue diamond type reports because we're able to uh, diamond type it using scientific methods. Mm -hmm. um, we do say in the report that famous uh, diamonds from Golconda are associated with this region and other famous uh, diamonds such as the Cullinan diamond are type 2A. Uh, when whenever we do link a stone to Golconda, it will usually be in a monograph form, and that's because we have received evidence, or due to the cutting style or is, right. or nature of the stone, we're able to track it down to ancient India. Pretty much, the stone right. has to be associated with times before the Brazilian um, exploration and discovery of diamonds, diamonds. in uh, 1726. <laughs> okay, wow. So anything that's, that's older than 1726 is known to be from the Golconda region, or at least India. Well, 1726 a year, we are talking yes. like so many years back. Exactly, exactly. So these Wonderful. are truly historic and unique diamonds. Are type 2A flawless diamonds from any other mine similar to Golconda diamonds? They do occasionally uh, get found in other mines, yes, yes. So there are mm -hmm. type 2 diamonds coming from other mines, but as I said before, they're extreme, extremely rare. They account for less than for the pink in particular, we're talking about less than a fraction of a percent of everything is found, so. So is there any book of recommendation where our audience can learn more about Golconda Diamond? Yes, so GI actually has put it, uh, put together an extensive reading list. So mm -hmm. on our website, uh, you, you can actually just uh, sort of Google GIA Diamonds in Ancient India, and you'll find this website that has an extensive reading list. It includes books, and articles, okay. and a lot of them are sort of open access because there are historic books as well. Famous Golconda diamonds apart from Kohinoor. Dresden There's Green, so the Orlov diamond. So the Dresden Green that is um, held in Germany now, uh, the largest um, green diamond uh, that we see, uh, we have the Orlov. All of these diamonds oftentimes get linked to curses just because of the fact that they're changing hands so many times. Yes, a lot of them yes. have had a, a, a tumultuous background where they've gone from empire, from Mughal emperors, eventually get taken over or sold to uh, royal families in, in uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. That's the most common comments that people are writing in that are yes. diamonds cursed. They are talking about all of diamonds, they are talking about hope diamonds. Just any diamond that is going to be that old and that valuable is going to be um, something that people want to get their hands on. So either they mm -hmm. get stolen or they get um, right. sold through unusual channels, such as the Hope Diamond, as I mentioned before, it got stolen, disappeared. Right. And it was a French blue for, for a very long time until it eventually reappeared, cut. So mm -hmm. uh, oh. regarding myths, so there the myths uh, associated with the mines as well. So one of the most well-known myths is uh, going to be uh, the Valley of the Gems. So okay. as I mentioned before, these, these diamonds are alluvial diamonds. They're found in ancient uh, riverbeds and valleys. And uh, one of the, the myths from, from associated with this is that you would have these poisonous serpents at the bottom that were guarding these stones. And in order to actually access them, uh, people would throw chunks of meat or, or carcasses, okay. so sheep Got carcasses, it. that would get stuck with the diamonds. And okay. then they would have these eagles soaring above that would pick up the meat, take them out of these deep valleys, and then by sort of scaring off the birds or shooting the birds, they'd be able to get these diamond-encrusted pieces of meat. So there are very, wow. very many ancient uh, myths that are 
that are associated with these diamonds in India. Lovely. Um, was Golconda a trade center? Yes, it was. So the the uh, the ancient fort of Golconda, which is about eleven kilometers west of uh, modern day Hyderabad, was a major major trading center for for diamonds. The region itself had approximately twenty different mi uh, diamond mines, yes. but the center actually did trading and cutting of diamonds that were coming from all over wow. India at the time. Wow. Amazing. I'm just thinking about the fact that uh, this we're talking about like 17th or the, or the 18th century when there was no technology, there was no machines, there was no electricity. And mm -hmm. all these famous diamonds were absolutely hand cut without any computerization, without nothing. It was just purely like the artisan's vision, you know, which they had in their mind as to how should they cut a diamond. It's wonderful. Yes. In fact, India, uh, in, in, in Indian uh, sort of manufacturers at the time were famous for being the best at cleaving diamonds. Yes. So effectively, they would hit the stone at just the right angle and sort of cut off, yes. effectively cleave off uh, chunks of the stone in order to reveal the in interior beauty of the stone and potentially remove any type of small imperfections that, that they'd have on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now, as we all know that 99% uh, diamonds that we have around the world, they all are cut and polished in India. That's particularly yes. in Surat. Yes. 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 And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's become the biggest uh, cut and polishing center in the world now. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a global power for that. Yes. And do Golkura diamonds come in sizes below five carats? Yes, they do. Um, it all has to do whether it's an old cut and has some form of historic significance that meant uh, has been tracked from before the 1700s. But the most famous ones are the ones which are big Golconda legendary diamonds. Exactly. It's just easier to track the larger diamonds. That, that, that's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's so well said. The thing at GIA that you would like to talk about as to how do GIA grade these Golconda diamonds? So these uh, Golconda diamonds would go through similar grading services that we use for for all the other diamonds coming in. So every diamond that comes through GIA is going to be analyzed using spectroscopic methods. Um, right. So we, for instance, do the diamond typing, we do the characterization according to the four C's. Um, for the, the more interesting stones, or if the client requests it and there's some sort of historic significance, we create these monographs. So it's this beautiful hardbound book that has information about the research and um, spectroscopy, the history wow. of the stone, the cutting of the stone. So quite often we track stones as they're being cut. Separate to the Golconda, we've also started doing diamond origin services. So we do work okay. with mining companies where okay. we're able to sort of uh, track a stone from the mine. It mm -hmm. comes into GIA, it gets cut, it returns. We are able to then match the original rough to the uh, faceted stone. And because of that, associate it to a specific mine. And uh, again, the, the locality of, of a stone really enhances the, the story. It can be used to enhance the story of a diamond, as an example, the Golconda diamonds. <laughs> are there any portraits cut Golconda diamonds? Yes, there are. I'm afraid I, I don't have any examples uh, to show you, but there are certainly some examples of, uh, of portrait cuts that have uh, survived through the years. Oftentimes, they're, they're used, as I, as I mentioned before, as sort of windows uh, to sort of view small portraits. Mm -hmm. Favorite cut because you know since Golconda diamonds are generally ancient cut and ancient portrait cut. So which is your famous uh, diamond <laughs> cut when it comes to Golconda? Uh, for Golconda diamonds, I think the uh, a lot of these are, are effectively some form of a old version of a of a cushion cut, and I think it really uh, shows the the transparency and it adds a little bit of sparkle to the stone. The mogul cuts as well because they are very very uh, unusual. You don't see those uh, very often. The mogul yes. cuts are something yes. that I'd personally obviously link to oh, yes. to the Golconda diamonds. There has been quite a few questions asking about the courses at GI, and uh, we have quite a few people who are interested in learning at GI. Mm -hmm. So would you like to highlight about how can they reach out to the institution? So if, if you just go to gia.edu, uh, you'll be able to sort of find your location. There are lots of courses. We do it globally. We do it, obviously, right now we're doing a lot of remote uh, training, but we do also in-house training now as well. Um, so we have several different courses. You can do a full graduate gemologist course, or you can do effectively just uh, different sections as well, depending mm -hmm. on your interest, whether it's diamonds or colored stones or pearls. 
Uh, so we have lots of different uh, types wow. of uh, degrees and, and we offer those globally. So it's very easy access. Right. We do a lot of remote learning as well. Uh, I think with that, it's a wrap. And guys, in case if we haven't answered your question, please feel free to either message me or to message at the GI Gram. And we'll be more than happy to answer all your questions about the Golconda Diamond. Thank you very much, Renu. And thank all you, right. everyone in the audience, for, for joining us today. Yes, and thank you so much and, and all the best. <laughs> thank you.